neural development, what we are interested in the lab is finding the genetic uh, regulators for how a neuron is born and then how does it function properly. Um, I was interested in one of those proteins and I will discuss that later on. And what we needed chance and expertise in was, uh, was getting publicly accessible data that was found in flies and in human cell lines. And no one had actually brought them together to find if there were any similarities between them. And I think that was a really important thing for us to find out what are the targets of my gene of interest. So that was a very good uh, uh, collaboration that uh, Chem and I had. And he has a really funny story about it, which I will leave for the middle part when Chem starts talking about how this collaboration started. So if you look at the brain of a human, a mouse, or a fly, they look structurally different. Despite the size difference and the morphological differences, the genetic basis for it is almost the same. They almost share the same circuitry for similar type of behavior. And this behavior, this mechanism, is conserved through evolution and it helps you to react to internal stimuli such as when you're hungry and you want food or to external stimuli such as uh, a knee-jerk response that you might have at the doctor's office or how you react to alcohol. So you can do all of these experiments on model organisms to understand what happens in human. Now in this case, if you go down into the second figure over here, you go from a top to a bottom down approach. You start with the organism, your brains are made up of these structures called neurons, and they make connections called synapses. Now, there are two parts to it. There's a synapse that's sending in the information called the presynapse. There's the uh, synapse that receives the information called the post-synapse. Uh, and they have different proteins that are expressed there, and those proteins um, are made from these regions of the DNA um, where gene expression happens. And if you were to take these, nucleate, these sequences together from a fly or a human, you can see that they're conserved through evolution. But what's really interesting is that when you talk about fly research, about 75% of all genes linked to human diseases are found in a fly. So with, what that means is that if you were to find a mutation in the human that causes a defect in a protein, which causes an effect at the synapse, which causes a behavioral defect or a structural defect in a human, you can do the same thing in a fly and then see if that recap is recapitulated in a fly or not. So one of the proteins that I was interested in is called Oculus. The human homologue for that, which means that same protein is found in a human, has the same function called TCF4, um, is involved in transcription. It's a transcription factor. It binds to the DNA binds to the DNA, and by binding to a target gene, it could regulate how much of the mRNA or how much of the protein is expressed. What's interesting is that this protein has been linked to an autism spectrum disorder called the Hopkins, and it's also been linked to schizophrenia. Now when you think about autism or schizophrenia, and when you look at the patients involved, you don't see any structural defects, you don't see a large part of the brain missing. You don't see a part being formed where it shouldn't be formed. So the basis for autism spectrum disorders and schizophrenia could be because of faulty wiring in your brain. So the, the synapses are probably not making the right connections or not at the right time. Because of that, we looked at circuits in a fly and in a mouse to see what, is the, what would happen when you reduce the expression of this protein called TCF4 or if you were to produce too much of it. So we looked at circuits in a fly, and what we saw was that when you reduce the protein called Oculus, there is more elaboration. So what you, you notice here is that this is a wildcat, which is a control. Compared to the wildcat, you see these, uh, near, these branches that are much more in number, much frequent. But when you were to overexpress it, so knock down, you have more elaboration. You overexpress it, there's fewer elaboration. So it tends to put the brakes on branching. If you were to look at the same, um, if you were to look at circuits in 
mice, for example, we see the same thing. In this case, what you're looking at is a mouse that was injected with a virus that would knock down or overexpress in certain populations of the brain. And if you look here, between a control and a knockdown, there's more branching, but you also notice that the branching starts earlier than normal, which is interesting. And then when you look at the overexpression, where we overexpressed TCF4, this protein, there's fewer branches. You don't even see it as clearly. And that's interesting. So what that means is that there's probably a break that TCF4 Dogmas puts in to prevent abnormal branching from happening. And there's complications in here as well. In red is a knockdown, in green is an overexpression. So you kind of have an idea that this feature is conserved between flies and mice. And if you were to put this information together, it would be almost like Goldilocks and the three bears, right? It's too hot, it's too cold, what you need is just right. In this case, when you knock it down, there's too much branching. When you overexpress it, there's too fewer branching. But since it's a transcription factor, it means that it must have targets. And what are these targets that it's regulating? How are these targets affecting our, uh, branching? And that was something that was really interesting because we had no clue what was going on. We could go ahead and do a fishing expedition and try to find out what the targets are, but that would either mean that you get them or you don't. And it depends on luck. What we wanted to do was we wanted to find relevant targets that are conserved between flies and humans. Based on publicly uh, accessible data that was already published by other groups that looked at human cell lines and flies. And we wanted to bring them together and find what are the relevant targets of Nautilus that are affecting the, the phenotype that we see in both flies and mice. And that was one of the help that we needed Chem's expertise in. So I'm going to let him tell you the story about how the collaboration started. Uh, before I start, I will apologize. I'm getting a little sick, so uh, I'll try to speak up. But if you can't hear me, please let me know. Okay. All right. So as Rich explained all of that, he needed some of my help. Uh, and it actually all started with a phone call. Uh, so it's a Friday, he calls me, I'm trying to get my lunch from the lunch trucks uh, and I can't hear anything that he's saying because the guy's trying to hand me my change and all of that. So I'm like, alright, well, all I heard was blah blah blah, help, I'll call you back. <laughs> uh, so I go back to my lab and I call him and he tells me that he's trying to do something that's taking him way too long and he's wondering if there's possibly a computer program out there uh, that he could use to speed it up. Uh, and I'm trying to understand what he's doing, and he's telling me all these crazy things, and uh, in the end, we figure out that he's trying to go to a website, look up the uh, gene name, look at its function name, and download it like different functions uh, into an Excel sheet. Uh, and I first tried to think about it, and I asked him questions, are you looking at them up manually? And, uh, and I also asked, are you doing the same thing for all of them? Like, does the website look the same? Are you looking at the same field for all of these genes? Uh, and luckily for me, the answer was yes. Uh, and Mitch was about to kill himself. In no or, or, right, or the or the computer itself. Uh, so I then had an idea, and I said, "All right, cool enough." Um, and I thought about writing a program just for Mitch, because the thing he was describing, uh, there could have been a program written by somebody else out there, but it was possibly going to be very expensive to buy and you will probably have to deal with licensing uh, and it will probably not even do exactly what he was looking for. So, here's what I did. I booted up a program called MATLAB. MATLAB is a technical computation tool, very famous in uh, engineering disciplines. It is very good with handling big amounts of data. 
Uh, it can process them, find statistics, write them into a file, print results in a fancy fashion. Uh, it can do all of those things in a very uh, fast manner. So I wrote a program. Let's see. If it's okay. Uh, it kind of looks like this. It's a bunch of computer language that I don't think Mitch understands, but luckily I did. Uh, so that's just a little uh, cutout out of my program. All it does is goes to the website that Mitch told me to go, puts in a keyword, gets the results. Uh, when it gets the results, everything gets dumped into MATLAB as an HTML text. I don't know if you are familiar with HTML, but that's basically uh, what you don't see behind every single web page. When you boot up Internet Explorer or Google Chrome, that program knows how to parse this text and knows how to display it nicely for your eyes. Okay. So I had to go in the backstage a little, uh, look at the HTML code, find the specific fields which was looking for, and I literally copied everything into a, uh, a variable within MATLAB. And in the end, I dumped everything into an Excel file. Okay. So I do that, and I send it to Mitch, and he's like, oh my god, this is amazing. Uh, how'd you do it? And I try to explain it to him, and I'm like, you know, I did some network programming, did some HTML parsing and string manipulation and some regular expressions, and he's like, okay, well, I need this now. And I was like, all right. Okay, uh, and I'm, I was pretty sure that he didn't understand any of that back then. Uh, so, he gives me a new task. Uh, I modify my code. Now the code is uh, targeting about 8,000 genes, thousands of genes, uh, and I try to run it. It's taking way too long. It takes about three to four hours to collect all of this data. Uh, and then, once I run everything, I send it to Mitch. Mitch tells me, eh, you know what? This is not what I really wanted. It's missing this. So I have to go back, modify the code again, run it again, which takes another three to four hours. Send it to Mitch. Hopefully he's happy then. But not really, because apparently there is some stuff missing in the, in the uh, results. And I'm like, Oh my god, what happened? Like it's the same exact code. How come it's not running now? And it was running before. So what I figured out was the first time I ran it, I was at home. I was using a Verizon Fios internet that was, you know, an average speed. And then I came to Drexel and all of a sudden I had this amazing fast internet and apparently the website I was trying to connect to didn't like that. It's a security feature. I work with network security and I was like, aha, I know what's happening here. The website thought that I was trying to bring it down by sending him about 10,000 requests for some data. Uh, so the website was like, you know what, I'm going to request, uh, refuse to talk to you. And then after like five seconds, it resets itself and then says, okay, well, I'll talk to you now. And I ask a bunch of gene conversions and then about two seconds later, it says, ah, you are being too much again. So I had to do some changes to my code. What I did was I put in some uh, pauses in between my request to the server. That made the server happy. Uh, except now the program that took three to four hours with the pauses in between takes twice or a little over twice the time about like, the whole day, basically. So, you know, and apart from that I have to deal with some minor bugs, <coughs> but nothing too crazy. The only thing that really made this task a challenge was uh, me and which uh, Mitch weren't speaking the same language. Uh, 
And I was explaining to him what I was doing. I was speaking as a computer engineer. When Mitch was explaining things to me, he was speaking to me as a biologist. So he was telling me things like FBGN, homology, chip chip, peroxin. I tried. Uh, and flies. Out of all that whole list, the only thing I got was flies. Uh, and when I was talking to him, I was saying things like end files, arrays, patterns, exceptions, uh, for loops, stuff like that. Uh, and I'm pretty sure the only thing he got out of that was patterns. So one and one, we are tied, all good. Uh, we did eventually fix this issue. Uh, all we had to do was have frequent meetings. Either he came to my lab or we went to uh, Office of Graduate Studies, got coffee, and while Taz and Sandra were working there, you know, we were discussing things and possibly annoying them, but you know, they were nice enough. Uh, or Gchat or Facebook Messenger was also a great, great tool for us. Uh, we basically just, if I had a small question for him, I just sent him a Gchat if it wasn't urgent he responded to me whenever he could. So, it wasn't too bad. Uh, just to go over the algorithm that we followed to come up with these uh, results. Uh, first, I was uh, asked to download human genes from a database. Uh, I called it the GSC data. Uh, I appreciate it might have a more technical term, but that's basically what I interpreted that as. After that, I had to convert these human gene names into function function names uh, that I could possibly match with the uh, fly gene function names. I then looked at uh, some statistics and ranked these genes so that we can determine which ones were more important to look at uh, so that we're not just wasting our time uh, looking at 8,000 genes uh, or 4,000 genes, something like that. Uh, and then, once we found the targets, uh, we then looked at which one of those genes actually dealt with the specific functions that Mitch was looking for. Uh, for example, some gene might determine uh, what color your eyes would be. Mitch wasn't interested in that, so we threw that out. Okay. So, the final product of all of this ended up being a Venn diagram that we can display. Uh, I wrote over a thousand lines of code for Mitch, which ran without any problems eventually. And in the end, out of about 4,000 genes on the FPGN data, uh, you might explain what that Fly is. Genes. Fly genes. Uh, and over about 8,000 from the human gene side, we found about 230-ish common genes that we would be interested in. And out of those, uh, we looked at which one of those 200-ish genes uh, correspond to what Mitch, Mitch's research is actually focusing on, uh, which is NNJ regulators. And out of that, there were about 23 genes uh, that we were interested in and then Mitch then took that further and did some testing uh, and he was able to verify that the ones that we found actually uh, do work the way they were supposed to. Uh, I'm going to hand over the presentation to Mitch again. Uh, he will explain what he actually verified so this is more of a proof of concept. So we got all this data. You have a biologist. You have some, someone who works with um, wireless networking. None of us have a background in bioinformatics. Uh, how can you trust this, right? So the data, that the results that we got, one of the genes was called norexin. It's a gene that is kind of like the glue that sticks one side of the synapse to the other. It's kind of like Velcro, if you were to think of it. Sticks the, the synapses together. And uh, what we wanted to do was, what is the effect that all this has on norexin? So we looked at, and then something that's also interesting is that norexin promotes more branching. 
So remember one of the things that we saw was that Dollar Swoop presses or puts the brakes on branching. So we as we uh, hypothesized that Dautilus has a negative effect on direction, and hence you don't have enough branching maybe when you overexpress it. So um, we looked at how much the levels of direction was. So when we knocked down Dautilus, so when we took out the brake effect of Dautilus on direction, you would assume that there would be more direction there, and that's just something that we see. If there's more direction there, there's going to be more branching. That's exactly what we saw initially. When we put too much of Dautilus in there, the direction didn't vary as much. It was almost the same. Then the other thing that's really important is to rescue the defect that you see. So you can have all of these defects, but if you can rescue the defect by either reducing the level of direction to bring it back to the same level as normal, um, that wouldn't actually say if, there's a, if they're on the same path or not. So if, in, in this case, the red identifies the knockdown, which when you knock down Dautilus, there's more branching. And the pink is when we knock down Dautilus as well as Dautilus, knock down Norexin together in the same um, population of cells to show that the branching effect reduces, to, goes back to almost normal. So um, one of the things that we think is that Norexin is partially mediating this increased branching by Dautilus. So with that said, if you have any questions for us, Um, we'll be able to talk a little bit about the application. 